So, a flood of biblical proportions. I'd like to tackle this topic under the following headings. I'm going to look at an introduction, we're then going to have our reading, as Brother Rich said. We're going to, going to uh, investigate that narrative. We're going to look at some evidence that supports that. And then importantly, we're going to look at the significance of that, how it applies to us, and then draw our thoughts to a conclusion. So I mentioned the word flooding. I'm not sure what comes to your minds first. Perhaps you might think of the floods that we've had here in recent years. We've had the floods around Tewkesbury Abbey, stranded there in the middle of nowhere. And I remember this one particularly from BBC News. It struck me. Or perhaps something like this. Now, I used to commute on trains for a number of years. I know some here do. And I think if I turned up to catch a train that day, I'd probably been quite relieved. Um, looks more like a boat's going to come. But these things happen. Perhaps you remember this. This is in 2012. Uh, this is the central, the, the, sorry, the Grand Western Central Canal, uh, when the embankment collapsed and a huge quantity of water uh, flooded through into the surrounding area. Or perhaps more recently, I remember in February this year we drove uh, down to Exeter to see my brother-in-law, see Joe. On the way down we passed through Somerset and these are the pictures of the Somerset floods. <laughs> Again, a colossal amount of water. Um, again, that gives a better perspective. A large area was flooded. Um, the Daily Telegraph reported earlier this year that at the time they were writing the article, at least 1.2 billion had been spent in trying to rectify what had happened, and of course, I'm sure much more was spent after that. But the reality is, as you all know, and the serious point is that flooding can be absolutely devastating. It can be devastating for people's lives, for the economy for infrastructure, and in so many other ways. But really, one way of looking at it is perhaps a reminder to us, and to the people that live in the world, of who's really in charge. Despite man's efforts, really ultimately we can't hold back these events. But it was an article from overseas <coughs> that got me thinking, and where we took part of our title from. And this was in Australia. It's a couple of years now ago in Queensland, Australia. And they had driving rain for several days non stop. And ultimately, an area the size of France and Germany combined was flooded. That's a large area. And you can see in the top right of the screen, France and Germany highlighted. We're talking a vast uh, proportion of land. Uh, over 200,000 people directly affected. The houses were swamped. And what's remarkable about this is it was a relatively short period of time. This was only a few days and this devastation happened. But what were they referring to in this article, in our topic, when, of course, we say biblical proportions? Well, perhaps some of these uh, pictures might mean something to you. I've got a few on the screen. Some artist's impressions. It's my favourite. I think that's brilliant. But... I think you've probably got the story now, I know where we're going with this. We're going to talk about the story of Noah. <coughs> so what was this story of Noah all about then? Well, it's a story covered in the Bible, hence the biblical proportions. And so we're going to take that reading now. It's Genesis chapter 6, and our president's going to read that for us. Thank you. Genesis chapter 6. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. <coughs> Make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall, be, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourselves, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. for that reading. So what was going on? We read how God uh, created the earth and everything in it, and as time passed, we're talking approximately a thousand years to 1,500 years, people began to forget about God. They forgot everything he had done for them and how he had instructed them to live their lives. To help us understand uh, this narrative, we're going to break it down into six sections. We're going to look at the context we're going to look at Noah's own family. We're going to look at the instructions for the ark. We're going to look at the flood itself, what happened after the flood, and the rainbow that concluded it all. So, firstly, the context, the circumstances surrounding Noah. Well, as we read, the Bible tells us that the times of Noah uh, were wicked times. God saw the evil thoughts of man's hearts and how they were steering them away from God. The times were so evil that God said he would destroy man from the earth. But God didn't forget a man called Noah. Why? Because Noah loved God. He sought to obey God. And God knew that he could use Noah to preach repentance to the people around him by building an ark or a large vessel or ship. And that was ultimately there to save those who would trust in God. In Genesis 6 and verse 8, the Bible tells us that this man called Noah found grace or favour in the sight of God. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So who is this man, Noah? Well, a family tree, hopefully you can you want to read every bit of detail. This is a family tree. Um, it takes us back to the time of Adam, the first man on the earth. We can see that Adam had three sons, Cain, Abel and Seth. And then down the line of Seth, we have important characters like Enoch, who walked with God. And also, then we come down to this man called Noah. As we read, Noah had three sons in our passage, Ham, Japheth and Shem. 
So this is where this man Noah comes from. And we read then that with his uh, three sons, their wives, and Noah's own wife, this was a group of eight people. And in the story then we find that these eight people were all that were saved. And it was down to them to replenish the earth. So we know that they, as mentioned, they were saved through this ark, or what was this ark? The instructions of the ark are in our chapter we read, and they also continue into chapter 7. Ultimately, this ark was a, a large boat that we used to preserve life. We also read that God brought the animals to Noah. We read that the clean animals would come into the ark in groups of seven. So that's in chapter 7, verse 2, we didn't read that. But the unclean, in 6, verse 20, excuse me, would come in two at a time. So unfortunately, those that like the song, the animals went in two by two, three by three, four by four isn't actually correct. Um, there we are. So the structure of the boat was explained by God. We did read part of that in our chapter. <coughs> Instructed Noah on the type of wood he'd use and how large the ark should be. Now it was given uh, in a measurement called a cubit, which we read. We can't be exactly definitive on what size this cubit is, but most scholars believe a cubit to be no less than 18 inches, approximately 46 centimetres. So if you translate that into the measurements for the ark, we get a, a vehicle or a, a boat that was 450 feet long, 140 metres, 75 feet wide, 23 metres, and 45 feet high, 14 metres. And we also read in our chapter it was divided into three levels. So we'll note we've said 450 feet, the image of the ark slightly longer, it's because some disagree slightly on the size of a cubit, but as an order of magnitude, this gives us an idea of the vessel we're talking about. So Queen Mary II, large cruise liner there, Titanic, a ship you probably all know about, and it gives us a comparison to the ark that Noah had to build. Bear in mind this was by hand, before any tools were invented, modern techniques, this was a, a large undertaking. This is in uh, Hong Kong, where they built a full-scale reconstruction. The reason I put this up, in the background you can see two elephants exiting the ark. It gives us an idea, in comparison to perhaps something we, we can picture, of to how large this vessel was. So that's the ark, briefly. So what about the flood then in the narrative? We come to the story of the flood in chapter 7, verse 7 to 24. Well, we know that Noah and his family entered into the ark alone. They were just eight of them, as we said, and then all the animals with them, the clean and the unclean. They had to wait in the ark seven days before the flood began. And it tells us in Genesis 7, verse 12 and 17, that they then raid actively and consistently for 40 days. Bear in mind earlier, the flood we talked about in Australia was to start for a few days. This was for 40 days, and the earth was flooded for 150 days, almost six months. So we're talking a colossal amount of water. We're not going into the details of where the water came from tonight. That's not the purpose of the talk, but we're talking a lot of water. So then after the flood, we read in Genesis 8, the waters began to recede. And after 150 days at sea, the ark settled onto Mount Ararat. Some of you might know where Ararat is. I didn't when I wrote this, so just for the research, uh, it's on the edge of Turkey. Give you an idea, so we're talking in the Middle East. Ararat has two peaks, has Greater Ararat, which is the highest peak in Turkey in the entire Armenian plateau. has an elevation of over 5,000 metres, almost 17,000 feet and then Lesser Ararat, which is almost 4,000 metres and almost 13,000 feet. And here we can see uh, Ararat itself. Um, and then here we have a panoramic view from what is present day at the top of Ararat. So we're talking quite a mountain. So when the ark rested here, we then read in the narrative that this man called Noah released two different types of birds to help him know if it's possible to leave the ark. The first he left was a raven, and that left and returned continuously until the waters receded. He then released a dove. The dove he sent out didn't find any place to rest the first time, so it returned to the ark. Seven days later he sent it out again, this time it brought back an olive branch. Another week later Noah sent the dove again, but it never returned. And so this told Noah it was time to leave the ark. 
And so we read in Genesis 8 and verse 20 that Noah and his children released the animals from the ark and they themselves exited and built an altar to God. And then finally, to encapsulate this particular story, we then read in Genesis 9, verse 8 to 17, how God makes a promise to Noah and the other seven that made it, how he would not destroy the earth again with a flood. And to prove this, he showed them a rainbow, and this was a token of promise that God would not flood the earth again. So I appreciate that's a whistle-stop store through the uh, narrative, uh, so give us a background to what we're going to look at now which is some evidence. Now, there's lots of different types of evidences and occurrences of evidence that we can turn to, to what we believe proves that the flood actually happened. There's lots of different theories on how the flood occurred. Some believe it was local, some believe it was global. But for the sake of this talk, we're not going to go into all of those details because we'd be here all night, I don't think you'd probably want that. We're going to look at a few geological evidences. Before I go any further, I want to make two important points. Firstly, none of us were there at the flood. No one alive today was there at the flood, save God. And so all we have is our inspired biblical record that we have before us, and interestingly, other occurrences from other civilizations which tell very similar stories. Again, something else you can look at in your own time. But we're never going to be able to prove exactly with physical evidence, categorically, <coughs> every minute detail of how and when the flood happened. However, the evidences that we look at and others can support and further prove us and encourage our faith in the things that we believe. And ultimately, I hope this will encourage you in your own time to look at further evidences. But secondly, and more importantly, we mustn't get lost in the story and the evidence. Because really, as the time as it was in the time of Noah, the same for us. There are more important lessons that this was all about. This is trying to prove spiritual lessons to the people then, and more importantly for us today. And we will look at some of those at the end. So evidence. Well, we read in Genesis 7 verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, in this day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So the earth was completely covered with water. Well, what evidence might we look for if this was the case? Wouldn't we expect to find billions of dead plants and animals buried in thick layers of sand and mud and lime, deposited by rapid water ingress? Well, that's exactly what we do find. And we're going to look at two of those as the start of our evidences. Firstly, fossils of sea creatures. And we're going to go now to um, Chile's Atacama Desert. <clears throat> Just uh, reminds us where Chile is down there on the west coast of Southern America. Now, I think you'd all agree with me naturally that whales don't tend to live in deserts, particularly deserts that are kilometres above sea level. But it's interesting what they found in the Atacama Desert in Chile. A couple of years ago, paleontologists dug up at least... 75 very well preserved whale fossils. They found what was a mass graveyard of whales when they came to widen this road that we can see here. And almost all of the fossils um, were baleen whales and these creatures are at least 8 metres long or 25 foot long. In case you've forgotten what a baleen whale was, there's one with its mouth open, there's one jumping out of the sea. The baleen just refers to a group of whales which filter their food through their mouth rather than having uh, teeth as a toothed whale. And they found these whales over a kilometre above sea level in the middle of a desert. Now you can read the articles in the newspaper and various scientists have come up with theories that they say categorically they can answer why they were there and they've got answers to all the queries. But they do write in all their articles that this mass graveyard was because all these animals succumbed to a sudden catastrophe. A sudden catastrophe in all of them. Perhaps it was a flood. Again, it can't be categoric, but even the scientists that say it wasn't a flood admit it all came to a succumb to a sudden catastrophic event. Well, let's go even higher now. 
Uh, we're going to go 7,000 feet above sea level. Now we're two kilometers above sea level. And it's beyond dispute among all of these geologists that on every continent there are fossils of sea creatures in rock layers which today are very high above sea level. Uh, and examples uh, that we can look at are in the Grand Canyon. In these layers here, you can see before us, are fossils um, in the topmost layer of the limestone, which are now exposed. And these are very high above sea level, as I said, talking about two kilometres up here or greater. Sorry, excuse me. And so, um, in other rocks in the Grand Canyon, we see examples of a lot of sea creatures deposited at what is very high sea uh, levels above the sea. What if, if we, keep, we keep going higher? We're going to now go to the uh, Himalayas. In the Himalayas, they've found marine fossils again, this time in the highest mountain range. They found marine life, or what was marine life, 8.8 kilometres above sea level. It's a vast height, we're talking almost 30,000 feet above sea level. Picture of the Himalayas. And these are what they found up in the Himalayas, this high above. These are called marine cephalopods, um, and they're found again in limestone beds in the Himalayas in Nepal. And geologists agree that ocean waters must <coughs> have buried these marine life. So at some point, this marine life was under water. Well, some of you might already know, or be aware of scientists then say, well, we can answer this because tectonic plates collide through the billions of years and they've pushed each other up and that's why they're now so high above sea level. That's why we're going to look at evidence too. Rapid burial of plants and animals. Now the quote now is taken from some uh, books and website. I'm going to quote, Countless billions of plants and animal fossils are found again in extensive graveyards where they had to be buried rapidly and on a massive colossal scale. Often, the fine details of the creatures are exquisitely preserved. And I hope you can all see this fairly well. This is an extract of the page of one of the books. Um, but in figure two, it speaks of billions of straight-shelled uh, nautiloids, I'm not marine biologists, but a particular type of sea creature, there were millions and found in one particular area. But what was interesting, these have also been found in the Grand Canyon. But why is that interesting? Well, the graveyard in the Grand Canyon stretches for 180 miles across northern Arizona and into southern Nevada. That's a colossal area. The area is measured to be 30,000 kilometers square, over well, 10,500 square miles. And these creatures vary in different sizes, which is interesting because some are small, some are very young, some are middle-aged and some are very old. And it's been calculated by the scientists that to form such a vast graveyard required 100 metres cube or 24 <coughs> cubic miles of lime, sand and silt flowing in a thick soup-like slurry at more than 5 metres per second or 11 miles per hour. We're talking huge quantities of material because it had to be that large to catastrophically overwhelm and bury this large a population of creatures. So we're talking rapid. Then what about this one? We come to uh, an example here. So if anyone can guess what creature that was when it was alive. We get them around the UK in the sea. Jellyfish? Absolutely, yeah. So jellyfish. Uh, this time, um, they've been found in Australia, and they found millions of these in a particular graveyard. Well, why is this interesting? Well, consider jellyfish. They're very soft, uh, squidgy creatures. I'm sure you've seen them on holiday, you've seen them washed up on the beach. And because of their makeup, once the sun gets on them, they very quickly break down, and then when they're beaten by the waves, this jelly-like structure very quickly destroys and is gone after a day or two. But these here that were found in Australia, you can still see all of their makeup of their body. They must have been fossilised in a very quick time period. Hence why we talk of rapid fossilisation. What about another one? Well, 
as a fisherman, or well, a lapsed fisherman at the moment, but was once a fisherman. Um, how about this one here? I don't know if anyone can make out what, have a go at what that is in the pictures, anyone know? Fish, fish eating a fish. Yeah, fish eating a fish. They, they, the scientists call it is caught in the act uh, of eating its last meal. But you think about that for a moment, if that had happened in the sea, say the larger fish died because of what it was eating was too big for it to swallow and they both died. Wouldn't that then come prey for something further up in the food chain? But no, these are fossilised in perfect condition to minute detail in the middle of eating its last meal. And finally, at last for this talk, um, another example here is, can anyone have a go at what that one is? Be impressed if you get it. Yeah, brilliant. I should guess you'd know, Don. But, uh, so this is uh, a, a, a sea creature giving birth. Now this sea creature here, gives the context, is two meters long, six foot long. We're talking a large animal, and it's giving birth to a baby. And again, you imagine this: in the middle of the act of giving birth, they die for whatever reason. Again, wouldn't they become prey? But once more, they're fossilized in perfect condition. It must have been rapid. And finally, another piece <coughs> of evidence um, for tonight, and so there are lots we can look at, but from a geological perspective, is erratic boulders. There's a lot of information on this. So, to save time, to, to keep it succinct, I don't need to do this, we put a bit of text on the screen. I'll let you just read that through yourselves now. So in places it doesn't read very well, I think it's a translation originally. But the general premise, and we should pick up again in the last paragraph, erratic boulders are rocks or boulders which are made up of the same lithology, so the physical characteristics are the same, which is how you can identify rocks as being from the same region. And this particular example, I say there are many others, this particular example, they found rocks in Germany which match exactly rocks in the mountainous regions of Scandinavia. And this happens throughout the world. Um, this is one of the larger examples. Um, this is the Madison Boulder. Uh, it's in New England, if memory serves me correctly. Again, we've got the context of a person. This is a large rock. And where it's ended up does not match any of the rock samples that are surrounding the area. So it must have travelled from somewhere. How does a rock that size travel? Again, it's a question, food for thought, but could it have been part of the flood? But as I said at the outset, the importance of this is not to get drowned in the detail or the specifics of the story, but really it's the significance. What was the meaning of the story? And what was the important spiritual lesson? And the one I want to focus on tonight, um, we can read of in Matthew, I'll put it up on the screen, but as in the days of Noah were, so should also the coming of the Son of Man be. Whereas in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So should also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we have in these few verses the lesson of always being ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we know that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth ultimately, and he will rule as king over it, just at the time of the flood, people didn't expect the sudden disaster. So they continued to live as if nothing was going to happen. There's nothing implicitly wrong with eating, drinking or being given in marriage. But that was all they thought about. That was what consumed their lives. They had forgotten about God. And so the flood came and suddenly swept them away. And so is the return of Jesus. Because we're told that there shall be one that shall be taken and the other left. We must always be prepared. Just as if you were warned that a burglar was going to burgle your house at some point but you didn't know when. You'd make sure you were ready and made all the preparations to keep your house safe. So we must be for the return of Christ. We must be ready and prepared. 
And so at the time of Noah, no, it, and so it is too in our day, it was really a call for action. We need to have faith, and we need to do something. Noah had faith, and he built an ark. Despite all the mocking of people around him, building an ark where there was no water near, what was he doing? <coughs> he remained faithful to his God. And so he saved him and his household. Shall we be like the people of Noah's day that mock others around us and ultimately will perish? Or shall we be like the man Noah who because of his faith acted and was saved by grace? Thank you.